Welcome to this week's topic, where we'll be discussing the role of government, policy, and politics. To that end, what we'll be trying to achieve this week is articulate a brief history of government's role in, and its relationship with business, appreciate the complex interactions among business, government, and the public, identify and describe government's non-regulatory influences, especially the concepts of industrial policy and privatization. And finally, we'll explain government regulation and identify the major reasons for regulation, the types of regulation and issues arising out of deregulation. So let's kick things off with the first topic, ILO, government's relationship with business. Can governments manage more ethically than capitalism? That's the question that guides the prescribed chapter for this week. As government involvement in business has increased, this question has taken center stage. The government tends to be, uh, become involved in business after serious problems arise, and there's been no shortage of problems, as we know. From this slide, it refers to slightly, and of course in your textbook, slightly dated issues uh, where we, we had the Enron, WorldCom, and other scandals, and then we had the financial crisis. And so this really resulted in government becoming a lot more involved with business than it might have been in the past. More recently, of course, we have the example of the pandemic where governments had to play a very central role in business recovery and continue to do so even today. So really government's involvement with business is like a pendulum that swings back and forth. Uh, business of course has never been really fond of government having an activist role in establishing the ground rules under which they operate. In contrast, public sentiment has actually been quite cynical going and cyclical, so going through periods when the public thinks government has too much power and other periods where the public believes that government should be more activist with regards to business. So, you know, this has everything to do with, you know, security payments, government's role with, um, sorry, public wanting to governments to be more involved in issues like climate change, modern slavery, et cetera. So just as the areas in which government has chosen to initiate legislation keep changing, the multiplicity of roles that government has assumed has also increased the complexity with business. So governments aren't only a regulator of business that can determine the rules of the game, but governments are also significant customers of business and have, have a lot of buying power that can affect a business or industry's likelihood of survival. So think of a business that sells medical equipment or drugs. Often the government is a very significant purchaser of those goods and sometimes services. Um, so yeah, it can, the main thing to recognize here is that government policy has a, often a very significant and material impact on the decisions that businesses make and in some cases, the survival of businesses. Governments can also create new businesses and industries through subsidization and privatization. We'll talk a bit more about that later, but basically, you know, governments through industrial policy can choose to subsidize certain sectors, which makes them flourish and grow. And governments can also sell off some of their assets um, and where they're taken private. This range of government roles illuminates the crucial interconnectedness between business and government and the difficulty that both businesses and the public have in fully understanding what government's role should be in relation to business. The fundamental question underlying our entire discussion of business or government relationships is what should the respective roles of business and government in our socioeconomic system be? This question is far easier to ask than it is to answer, but as we explore it in the lecture as well as in your readings, some important basic understandings um, start to emerge. So this issue could be actually be stated in a different way. Given all, all everything that's 
um, required in order to make our society work, which of these tasks should be handled by government and which one should be the responsibility of business? So this poses the issue clearly, but other questions remain unanswered. If we decide, for example, that it's best to let business handle the production and distribution roles in our society, the next question is then, how much freedom are we willing, are we willing to allow business? So if our goals were simply produce, distribute goods, we wouldn't have to constrain business severely. However, we do know that in modern times, our other goals have been added to production and distribution. So a safe working environment for those who are making stuff, equally employment opportunities, fair play, clean air, safe products, and you know, there's a long list. So when you just think about basic production and distribution, there are a lot of socioeconomic and environmental factors that need to be considered as part of that. It's not as simple as just giving those functions purely to business. And so because we don't automatically factor these socially oriented issues into business decision making, it often then falls on the government to ensure that those goals of what business is doing reflect these social and environmental concerns. So while the market dictates economic production decisions, governments become really the citizens designated representatives um, that are there to protect the public interest. So this, this concept is more broadly known as externality. So when a business produces something, it produces other unintended consequences, some positive, some negative. And so it becomes government's role to step in to minimize the negative externalities and to encourage positive externalities. So this table here emphasizes really the crux of the antagonistic relationship that's evolved between business and government over the years. Although this clash varies between different countries and cultures, the underlying tension between business and government still holds true. And this, this problem is called a clash of ethical systems. The two ethical systems or systems of belief are the individualistic ethic of business and the collectivist ethic of government. So this relationship is even more complex in the 21st century. So as we have you know, the goals and the values of a pluralistic complex society increasing over time, economic conditions really constrain government um, and business to take a more active role in addressing these social and environmental issues. So, and don't forget, I mean, there are other groups and stakeholders as well beyond government um, and businesses, you know, such as the third sector, you know, charities, um, other interest groups like not-for-profit organizations, which are not captured in this. And that adds even more tension um, and creates another range of ethical systems in addition to these two. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this um, topic, ILO. For the review and reflect, um, I'd like you to look for real world examples of how government policy affects business. Um, and so to kick things off, I've given you two examples. The first example uh, links through to an Australian government website where it outlines a range of incentives or rebates that the government offers businesses of various sizes. Um, yeah, so they offer these rebates for, for businesses to be able to switch to more renewable energy through installing rooftop solar or battery storage. Then the second example is about the Amazon. Um, so you probably, you know, in the news, um, have heard about the rapid deforestation that's happening and land clearing in the Amazon. Of course, this is a problem that's been around forever, but has escalated recently. And so this article talks about the role of government policy in Brazil and regulation that has actually created the wrong incentives for deforestation and land clearing. So these, as I said, are examples. I want you to go out and find and research some of your own examples of uh, 
how government has been involved in a business either becoming more or sector becoming more sustainable or where government intervention has actually made a particular sector or business less sustainable. Now for the second ILO, we extend our discussion and our consideration of the role of business and government to including the public in that um, debate as well. So we saw in the last ILO that government influences business through regulation, taxation, and other forms of persuasion um, that we'll consider actually in detail in the next ILO. Business likewise has its approaches to influencing government. So lobbying in one form of another or another is business's primary means of influencing government. So let's say your business is highly polluting um, and there's a carbon tax that's introduced. So a lot of businesses, particularly the powerful ones, will start conversations, will start lobbying government to change the regulation or to block certain regulation so that it ends up in their favor. So this is widely known, um, this act of lobbying and happens all over the world. The public, on the other hand, uses the political process of voting and electing officials or removing them from office to influence government. Uh, the public also exerts its influence by forming special interest groups, you know, farmers, for example, small business owners, educators, senior citizens. They all have and form these special interest groups who then collectively have a louder and more powerful voice. So they can target more specific policy and more specific, have specific influence in the government. The government in turn uses politicking, public policy formation and other political influences to have an impact on the public. So you can see from the slide that it's really a three way relationship that needs to be managed and can get quite complex. And then the next relationship between that triad is the relationship between business and the public. And so business influences the public through advertising, public relations, and other forms of communication through their products and services as well. And the public influences business through the marketplace or by forming special interest groups such as, you know, Friends of the Earth or PETA or one of these other NGOs um, and protest groups. So if they're unhappy, if the public is unhappy about something, and of course, in the age of social media that we have today, uh, if the public is unhappy about any activity that a business is engaged in, there are a lot of forums through which they can voice that discontent. So, you know, earlier on, we raised the question whether the government really represents the public. And we can actually state that question now in a different way. Who determines what's in the public interest? In our pluralistic society, determining the public interest is not a very simple thing to do. So even though we elect government as part of official representatives of the public, that representation doesn't happen in a very straightforward way. Um, so really, if we think about business, government, and the public, it's, it's an interplay, an influence there's an influencing process between government, business, and the public that results in certain outcomes, which are not always in public interest, but also very often are. So this slide over here summarizes everything we've been talking about. Um, particularly, you know, the direction of the arrows talks about the, where the influence is coming from and how that influence is exerted. So for example, um, when we talk about the business and the relationship between business and the public, you know, if, they, if we look at the blue arrow, business influences the public or interacts with them through things like advertising and public relations and their products. Um, similarly, the blue line, you know, government influences business through regulation and other forms of persuasion. And then the relationship also goes the other way with the red arrows. So just really summarizing what we've discussed so far. All right, so at the end of this particular ILO, the review and reflect is 
somewhat different. I'm introducing a new concept here, but it's a way of understanding how businesses engage with other players who are not their competitors. So these are called non-market strategies, and they're a way that businesses address the interplay between themselves, government, and the public. So even though we don't really, as I said, it's a concept that's outside the scope of this subject, it's still interesting because it's such a growing area um, that businesses are adopting. So often there are people um, in the senior leadership team who are responsible for this function. And in the example that I've given you over here in the reading, um, it's an excellent example of Novartis, who is a pharmaceutical, it's a pharmaceutical company, and how it deploys non-market strategy. Um, I'd only like you to read pages 41 and 42, um, because it's quite a long article, but it is really cool and interesting if you wanted to read the rest of it to learn more about non-market strategy and to really understand the concepts that, that have been discussed um, in this particular ILO. All right, so for the third ILO, we look at government non-regulatory influence. We'll discuss regulatory influence in the next ILO, but for this particular one, it's important for you to understand that governments do get involved with business and with the public in a way that doesn't always involve regulation or you know, setting standards and rules. There are other ways that government gets involved. And the two that we will consider specifically here are industrial policy and privatization. So industrial policy is concerned with the role that government plays in an economy and privatization looks at whether current public functions like education, transport, social security should be turned over to the private sector. So both of these issues have important implications for the business government relationship. And they're both important and seem to, you know, they tend to come in and get in and out of popularity on a regular basis. Industrial policy can be defined and is defined in your textbook as every form of state or government intervention that affects industry as a distinct part of the economy. It's a really broad definition and doesn't give us enough uh, focus to understand the concept. Industrial policy changes over time and across countries, both in philosophy and its actions. Um, the trend towards industrial policy is likely to continue for a while as countries work to recover from the after effects of the range of shocks we've had all the way from the global financial crisis to more recently, the pandemic. So basically what it means is governments intervene in certain industries or sectors, either as a way to stop that sector from doing something or to encourage investment into that particular sector. So for example, um, in Australia, we know that the um, the hospitality sector was really affected as a result of COVID because people were locked down, couldn't go out to eat. And so the small business owners of restaurants, cafes were negatively affected. And so when the government decides that this is a sector that's worth saving and that needs um, its help, you know, they start to offer vouchers for people to eat out into the city or they offer um, certain kinds of tax breaks or, you know, they basically find a way to support an industry so that it can go back to flourishing. Another example of industrial policy is, say, um, if a government is interested in attracting foreign investment into a particular sector, so we know, for example, that the market for battery storage is growing. Um, so battery storage for storing, say, solar energy or other forms of, non of uh, renewable energy. So in that case, governments might choose to offer low interest loans or tax breaks or other ways to attract 
investment into those particular sectors. So that's another example of industrial policy. So you can see it doesn't involve getting the law involved. There's no regulation. It's done through subsidies, through tax breaks. Um, sometimes they can increase taxes, say, you know, when in the case of industries like tobacco and alcohol, where the government wants to discourage extensive usage, they then do the opposite, which is, say, introduce large taxes and other ways to discourage participation. Privatization, on the other hand, is the process of changing a public organization, so publicly owned, to private control or ownership. There are a lot of examples of this in history, you know, thinking about Australia, Telstra used to be a public company, which is our largest telecommunications provider. So in other words, it was the government that controlled and owned the company. Same with Qantas, which is our national airline. But over time, those assets have been sold to the private sector, and that's called privatization. Okay, and so the idea often of privatization, and this is really, this became really popular in the 1980s through the policies of Ronald Reagan in the US and Margaret Thatcher in the UK, who wanted to basically make government um, services more efficient. So, you know, electricity, railroads, etc. So the argument for privatization is most often an efficiency one to say, well, you know, if this was given to private hands, it, it will become more efficiently run. From a sustainability perspective, you know, again, you're probably wondering, well, what has this got to do with sustainability? Well, the issue here has to do with the nature of the good. And so as soon as something is privatized, market forces come into play. And so the prices are then determined by supply and demand, not by the government saying, okay, this is the maximum price you can charge for, say, electricity. Now, when it comes to equity and social ac and access to certain goods and services, if it's privatized, in order to drive efficiency, so something like, I mean, I can think of two examples that are relevant here from a kind of a social perspective. One is prisons. So, you know, prisons are often controlled and run by government. But you could argue that if, it's, if they're privatized, they'll be more efficient and the cost will be lower and so taxpayers also don't have to fund them. But the challenge there is, you know, there are certain basic standards, quality standards, let's say around security that a prison needs to have, that if it lands up in the pri in private hands, it might not be managed as well in order to save costs, which is what happens when you privatize things. Another example is electricity. Now, given the current wars that we have, shortage of coal, of gas, uh, and the increasing prices, if that's fully privatized, the price of electricity, as high as it is now, it could be even higher if it's fully privatized. The government has no say. And that obviously would really impact people on very low incomes. And so, as I said, it goes back to the nature of the good. Is electricity a public good? Um, you know, that's in economics, you learn about different types of goods. And that's outside the scope of the subject, but certain goods are classified as public goods. So in other words, they have a welfare component. And so um, this debate of privatization and industrial policy is important from a sustainability perspective because it affects the, or rather it has impacts on society and the environment based on whether governments are involved to protect those social groups or to protect the environment or not. So here's just a reminder of, so in addition to the two that we looked at around uh, privatization and industrial policy, government actually has other uh, non-regulatory influences. So for example, government is in most countries a massive employer, so it creates employment. 
this government sets standards across industries and also governments, as I mentioned earlier, are one of the largest purchasers or buyers of goods and services from the private sector. So they're a key stakeholder in that sense too. The other way that government influences business, as I also mentioned before, governments offer subsidies where they want to attract investment in certain sectors. They're involved in transfer payments across countries. They offer loans. They deploy taxation. They're responsible for monetary policy, which influences business. And of course, moral suasion, um, you know, in terms of setting the basic standards or accepted standards of behavior. All right, so at the end of this topic, ILO, the review and reflect is a video um, which shows how China is using a mix of non-regulatory influence, including industrial policy to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. So this really synthesizes and consolidates the key concepts that you've learned in this particular ILO. Okay, so for the final topic ILO, we will look at government regulatory influence. So this is a setting of rules and standards and laws. And of all government influence, this is probably the one that is least liked by business. So yeah, this is a very controversial issue in the business government um, relationship, and it affects virtually every aspect of how businesses function. It affects the terms and conditions under which businesses compete in their respective industries. It's touch it touches almost every business decision, ranging from the production of goods and services to packaging, distribution, marketing, and service. So most people would agree actually that some degree of regulation is necessary to ensure that consumers and employers are treated fairly and protected, and also that they're not exposed to unreasonable hazards um, as well. Also, we know increasingly that regulation protects the natural environment too, which is important. So in, in fact, businesses have often pushed for greater regulation in some instances, uh, believing that certain regulations can give them a competitive edge. So for example, you know, infant industries like you know, power manufacturers in Australia were protected by government tariffs, which is a form of regulation on imported cars, which would allow them to flourish. So in that case, certain industries push for regulation where it can give them um, an advantage over their competitors, often international competitors. But in a lot of cases, businesses think that government regulation is too extensive in scope. It's too expensive. And the actual work that's involved in complying with legislation takes up a lot of time and has very high transaction costs. So I guess it's useful at this stage to have a definition of what regulation is, even though we've been talking about it. But the, the, the definition is, it is the act of governing, directing according to rule, or bringing under the control of law or constituted authority. So really, I mean, this is common knowledge, but it is useful to have a formal definition. All right, so why do governments regulate business? And the main reason has to do with this concept of market failure. In one of your earlier classes, I told you about market failure and the two most common forms of market failure. One is externalities. So market failure arises when markets are, aren't able to work in a way that kind of resolves for a lot of these outside issues. So externalities is one. In other words, you know, when you demand and supply determine the price for something, that price doesn't include the cost to innocent bystanders positively or negatively. So that's an externality. The other form of market failure has to do with market power. So the existence of monopolies, for example. So when monopolies exist, 
uh, we know that consumers are negatively affected because the price is much higher than would exist under a more competitive scenario. So these are some of the reasons why regulation exists um, as listed on here. And I encourage you to go through the prescribed reading, which explains these in a lot more detail rather than me explaining it to you now and boring you. Another useful way to categorize regulation is the distinction between economic and social regulation. So it's become customary then to identify these two types of regulation where economic regulation is concerned with market conditions and economic variables. And the industries that are affected are, you know, things like railroads, aeronautics, and communication. Social regulation is where the regulation deals with people, hence the word regulation. So employees, consumers, and citizens, and virtually all industries are actually impacted by social regulation because most industries employ people and most industries have customers and suppliers as well. There are a lot of issues that arise um, as a result of regulation, negative or unintended consequences. And so whenever a government is deciding on implementing a new regulation, let's say putting a price on carbon or the Modern Slavery Act that was introduced in Australia, there's a lot of debate that's required in government before legislation is passed. And that's because every single form of regulation has pros and cons. And so there's that trade-off. And so regulation is often passed when the gains are seen to be greater than the losses because there always will be losses. So these three examples here highlight examples, highlight cases when regulation can have a detrimental effect. Firstly, innovation may be affected. Okay, so if, you're, if there's regulation, say, in the pharmaceutical industry that requires that all companies produce 80% of certain life-saving drugs, in order to meet that target, it gives businesses very little room to experiment. And so as a result, they might end up not investing heavily in R&D and innovation to create a pipeline of medicines to solve issues or solve diseases that might come up in the future, right? So innovation can be affected when regulation forces businesses to focus on one specific thing. In the same way, um, new investments and plant and equipment may be affected. So it's similar in that if a business is focused is forced to focus on one area, it lowers the level of investment in other areas. But more than that, it's also about the cost of compliance. So when businesses have to invest a lot of time and effort in meeting regulatory requirements, it takes away from the ability to invest from a time and a resource perspective in other areas too. And then finally, small businesses can be adversely affected because federal regulations often tend to be targeted at issues that are caused by very large businesses. So say modern slavery. And that's why there are clauses in that regulation that it only applies to businesses who earn above a certain level of revenue every year. Because if they were to apply to all businesses, in that case, the cost of compliance for smaller businesses would be far too great. Okay, so another perspective of this is to look at the opposite, which is deregulation. So that's when a certain industry or sector or company has been highly regulated, so under government control, and then is now that regulation has been removed. So deregulation is often used synonymously with privatization because it goes out of government hands into the private sector. So this acts as a counterforce um, where you don't want too many assets that are controlled by the business, but you want some in private hands. And so it's always this tension between 
freedom and control for business and what will be best for society. So deregulation depends on a lot of things, but from a sustainability perspective, most importantly, the nature, again, of the good, whether it's a public good or not. And again, the idea behind deregulation or privatization is to increase competition and efficiency um, to lower prices and increase the levels of innovation. So we've certainly seen that deregulation of the Telstra and Qantas in Australia has had positive benefits from the perspective of lower prices, efficiency and innovation. So, you know, there are cases where deregulation hasn't worked, but in a lot of cases, it has been a positive as well. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this ILO and this topic. And for this particular review and reflect, I'd like you to consolidate what you've learned in this topic ILO with a specific focus on regulation and sustainability. So read through the article and then answer four multiple choice questions based on the article. Okay, so here are the answers to the multiple choice questions. Um, I hope you managed to get all four of them right. And that brings us to the end of this week's topic. For the next topic, which is on innovation and change for sustainability, make sure you read the materials for that particular topic, work through the, uh, any activities, and of course, make sure you review this week's content as you progress as well.